Hey all, welcome back to Chip Stock Investor. We have reviewed both our top chip stocks of 2024 and our top stocks that are not semiconductor related in our last two videos. Today, we're going to give you a little more insight into our portfolio with some context and nuance and discuss the stocks that we sold in 2023 and the stocks we're still holding in 2024. Before we begin, let us remind you to check out our semiconductor industry flow video and manual that you can purchase at our Kofi shop. It's a primer on the semiconductor industry, how various segments work, how companies in the industry make money, and how you can think about investing in chip stocks in 2024. And of course, if you haven't subbed already, now is the time to press that subscribe button and enable notifications so that you don't miss an update. Here is the stocks we sold portion of this video. Kicking it off, Casey, I thought, let's just start with the big one, Apple. Ticker symbol AAPL probably needs zero introduction here whatsoever. And I will say this though, we still own quite a bit of Apple. In fact, if you look at it on an index basis, comparing Apple's makeup to the S&P 500, we are still a bit over allocated to Apple. Why is that? Well, we still own ample amounts of the ETF's Vanguard growth, ticker VUG. Apple's about 13% of that portfolio and Vanguard information technology ETF, ticker VGT, which Apple's about 22% of that. And of course, also Berkshire Hathaway BRK.B, nearly 50% of Warren Buffett's publicly traded stock portfolio is Apple. And we do own some Apple still in our retirement accounts, but we did sell quite a bit of Apple at the very tail end of 2023 for just over 190 bucks a share. We've been Apple shareholders for a very long time, one of our oldest positions. But the reason we sold, first, it's a valuation concern. We see a very high valuation, over 30 times earnings for what we think could be the slowest growing tech giant going forward. We don't think the Vision Pro is going to be the big breakthrough that Apple touted it as earlier last year. We could be wrong. It could absolutely be another iPhone moment, but... We just don't think so, especially with Meta, a company that has really tried to go all in on this augmented and virtual reality thing with the metaverse, not really getting all that huge of, of a bump from its Quest headsets, more affordable headsets than what the Vision Pro will be. Also, it was interesting to see Barclays downgrade of Apple to kick off the new year. So it seems we aren't the only ones that have been sounding the alarm on Apple. Apple's current stock valuation. For each of these, we've extracted a lesson that we have learned during our time in investing. And for this one, the lesson is, this is about knowing our portfolio, how it's constructed, what's moving the needle. We knew we were heavily over allocated to Apple. And after the bear market of the last two plus years, it seemed time to take more profit and reallocate. Plus, we own other tech giants, so owning an oversized position in Apple seemed redundant at this point. Let's move on to Etsy. This is another stock we sold at the end of 2023. The pandemic grew this company significantly, but after everyone went back to work and stopped buying handmade masks, it has taken a bit of a hit and has been very slow to recover. Etsy's most recent quarter, while not a disaster, left investors feeling meh, to say the least. The holiday season outlook also wasn't great, expecting a slight decline in Q4 of 2023 and concerns still linger about competition in the online marketplace and Etsy's abilities to keep its niche charm while scaling up. While Nick and I really like this style of e-commerce, we need to take a breather on Etsy and see what happens in the coming quarters before we become shareholders again. This was a tough decision. This is another one that we've owned for a number of years. I think we took our first stake in Etsy when it was really still just a, a small cap business back in 2017, 2018. So we made good money on the company, but the lesson here that we wanted to extract from this 
and share with you is uh, e-commerce and retail. It's a really, really massive market. It's, it's top of that inverted pyramid, the, the funnel and the economic hierarchy that we've been sharing with you. So there are lots of choices out there for us as investors. And we simply just saw better options available to us after what's been now a pretty long run of mediocre returns for Etsy. And with a round of layoffs just announced, that was a bit of validation for our decision, I think, as well, wasn't it? That there's probably still some tough times ahead for Etsy. So for now, we exited the position and we reallocated the proceeds into Amazon, which we shared with you on our last video. The lesson, again, just to reiterate, when there's lots of choices, a good choice may still not be the best choice. So got to look at the whole field of competition. Number three, another tough one, Casey, you were very happy to see finally leave the portfolio, given your medical background, Teladoc, ticker symbol T-D-O-C. This is another one we owned for a long time. This was a promising business. I wanted it to be so badly because I caught wind of it Shortly, not long after its IPO in 2015, we finally started nibbling in early 2017. And it was a good growth story over the years. But again, similar to like you pointed out with Etsy, after the, you know, the pandemic, when telehealth visits reached their peak, Teladoc went into a slump ever since then. Casey, as you have said, turns out people really like that in-person visit with their doctor. The lesson for this one is listen to your wife. No, really, the lesson is, and one that we can repeat multiple times, sometimes the original investment thesis can be proven wrong. And it's important to know and to move on when your thesis gets busted. So that's why we exited out of Teladoc. And that leads us into our next digital healthcare stock that we got rid of in 2023, Doximity ticker D-O-C-S. After initially soaring during the pandemic, its growth expectations fizzled and plummeted by half compared to its own projections. This, coupled with high reliance on advertising revenue and lackluster upsell opportunities, painted a worrisome picture for us. While the company boasts a strong app and a loyal user base and it has doubled down on its future outlook. The immediate term just feels too shaky for our taste. So same investment lesson and takeaway as Teladoc, except this one we didn't, or, or I, maybe I should say I didn't wait for forever. Once the original investment thesis we had for Doximity seemed to have failed, we weren't really interested in a small cap rebound story in healthcare. So we just simply moved on. You'll notice this theme will pop up again here momentarily when we talk about another long time holding that we still actually own and hold on to. But again, I think the takeaway for us here is we believe that quality businesses that turn a profit, they have healthy balance sheets, they participate in secular growth trends. There is an upward bias there because you have management and employees working on progressing the business. So we think over the long term, there's upward bias for stocks of companies like this. But again, just to reiterate this point, if the original investment thesis goes bust, there's not a lot of point in continuing to hold when you have other options available to you. So that's our investment takeaway from this one as well. All right. Another one in stocks we sold another one that we actually do still have a position in it, but we have been slowly exiting in recent months. And that is Micron, ticker symbol MU. So Micron, once again, just recently upgraded its revenue guidance. It appears that a rebound in PC and smartphone sales are going to lift Micron higher. Consumer spending on tech devices, it, it's bottomed and demand is getting healthy. But Micron still has a long ways to go to dig themselves out of the hole they were in. But even ahead of the company returning to profitability, Micron was still up about 50% in 2023. And it's actually reapproaching all time highs, even though revenue was far below all time highs and it's, again, unprofitable. Check our last update on Micron that we did a few weeks ago. However, uh, we really believe that most of the rebound for 2024 for my business is already priced in. 
And again, we see uh, lots of other memory chip companies like Pure Storage that are less cyclical than Micron's business. So although the memory market appears to be climbing out of that hole, we decided to uh, take some profit off the table in this one and start allocating our money somewhere else. Again, Pure Storage, and we've also talked about that small cap silicon motion. The lesson for us here, this is about portfolio diversification. We didn't need another highly cyclical stock. So we were on the hunt to find those businesses that have figured out how to skirt the memory chip cycle. Another one that we held on to for quite some time, and this goes along with our Apple thesis, Skyworks Solutions, ticker symbol SWKS. We hoped this company would diversify away from Apple, and they did a little, but just not enough for us. Apple's overall product sales dipped in 2023, dragging down their chip supplier, Skyworks Solutions, despite some bright spots like the iPhone 15 success. While Skyworks boasts robust free cash flow and looks cheap on paper, its reliance on Apple and a lackluster non-smartphone business growth makes it a gamble compared to more diversified companies like Qualcomm. They are still tied at Apple's hip, and thus, with our overall thesis on Apple decreasing, we felt it was time to part ways with Skyworks and invest in other companies like Qualcomm. Maybe just a note here, because this was pointed out to us earlier in the year when we first started talking about parting ways with Skyworks. This is a cyclical business. Skyworks is an IDM, integrated device manufacturer. You don't want to sell at the bottom of the cycle. So maybe just to note, uh, our average sales price on Skyworks solutions is 110 to 115 bucks per share. So we did not sell it during that last final dip in October and November. Just wanted to point that out. But ultimately, in case you we did move out of this cyclical business and just sort of reallocated it to other cyclical businesses that we liked a bit better. So the lesson here that I think we would point out is customer concentration. When going through our checks on what makes a good long-term investment, Skyworks Solutions actually never really checked off that box because two-thirds of its revenue still is directly tied to Apple and they've never been able to shake that risk. So sometimes customer concentration is just inherent in a business, but sometimes it isn't. And that can pose a big risk if the business is not able to successfully diversify its customer count. So that's why we left Skyworks Solutions behind in 2023. All right, the next one, let's talk about cybersecurity, Sentinel-1, ticker symbol S. So while Sentinel-1's stock rally is definitely exciting, and it made us a little bit of money, because we bought early in 2023. Its future in 2024, at least as a fully independent business, looks a bit shaky to us. So the revenue growth remains strong, though it is slowing. The company still deeply, deeply unprofitable, but lots of potential here if Sentinel-1 can make progress on those fronts. Here's the big risk that we initially did not fully account for when we bought a very small position early in 2023. The shareholder makeup. Venture capital shareholders are still very much in control of Sentinel-1. We talked about this in past videos where we noted why we were exiting the company. Financial resources as a plus aside for Sentinel-1, this does not really look like a value play when you have these venture capital shareholders looking for the exit. Doesn't seem that Sentinel-1's big shareholders have the same goals as we do as long-term investors. The lesson on this one and the reason that we sold Sentinel-1 in 2023 is who your fellow shareholders are matters. We will double down on our efforts to understand share classes and who has controlling stakes in businesses going forward. That brings us to our final stock that we sold in 2023, Unity Software, ticker symbol U. Unity's woes really piled up this year with a controversial CEO exit and stalled growth, while a competitor like AppLovin shined with big gains in profit margins. So with Unity's internal drama and market headwinds, we decided to ditch Unity stock and focus our 
stock watching onto a company like App Lovin, betting on its cleaner house and promising future in app development. We've shared some articles on App Lovin in our community board, but at some point in 2024, perhaps we'll do a deeper dive into App Lovin's business in video form. We initially liked Unity Software as a type of picks and shovels play on the video game market, and it just didn't it just didn't work out. The lesson here, as I think we've been trying to communicate all year, is small software companies are really vulnerable. It's just really hard to build a successful publicly traded software company, even as you start to approach large scale. There's just not a lot of defensible moat, as many investors like to call it, for a software-based business. So as we've been communicating throughout the year, we prefer either very, very large, well-diversified software companies or companies that are on their way towards building that, or some companies that are able to combine a bit of both software and hardware. So they get the scalability of the software, but some of the protection, some of the uh, competitive advantages of a hardware-based business. So that's why we exited Unity Software a company in a very vulnerable position and not at all where we would have liked to have seen it on its profit margin journey. Okay, moving on to our second segment of this episode, stocks that we still hold going into 2024. And the first one, I'm a bit surprised that we continue to hold this stock. Disney, ticker symbol DIS. Nick, explain to us why we're still holding on to this 10-year lackluster performing stock. So if you told me in November 2022, when Bob Iger came back as CEO, that we would still own Disney over a year later, I'd have been shocked. So why do we still have it? I don't know. We're probably not going to own it beyond 2024, though, is my bet. The reason we still have it, though, is the, the company obviously still has tremendous potential. There's no reason this should have absolutely been such a horrible performer compared to the market overall over the last decade. So we don't really want to sell short the company's potential. They have the streaming service, Disney Plus, that remains unprofitable, but they're making fast progress on fixing that. ESPN looks like Disney's working out ways to better monetize that. And with Iger back in at the helm, it looks like the company is looking at other ways, other options besides just raising theme park prices every single year on its its patrons. Our plan is to fully divest ourselves of Disney as soon as we start to see some signs that the company's future potential gets realized in the stock price. I, I think that's the only thing at this point that's been holding us back. But man, it's been a rough year plus since we originally started voicing our absolute complete displeasure with where this media business is at. I, I would just note this too. We did this in our survey yesterday on our community board, but we are going to discuss the predicament that many media companies are in right now in an upcoming video about that New York Times lawsuit against Microsoft and OpenAI. But we'll delve into that subject a little bit more soon. The lesson is the same as in a couple of other stocks we've already mentioned. Eventually, sometimes the original investment thesis goes bust and it's time to move on. We're holding on to Disney for now, but as Nick mentioned, we plan to divest ourselves of this stock as soon as it's palatable for us. Let's talk about two digital payment companies that we still hold in our portfolio. The first is PayPal. The valuation still looks cheap and it's managing to grow at a modest pace and a new CEO could help in a big way rejuvenating the business overall. The second one, Nick, is... Another one that you absolutely hate, Block, ticker symbol SQ, similar to what you just said, although there's no new CEO. We hope Jack Dorsey is getting more serious about running a sustainable business. It appears that they are. Some profit margin expansion has been there as of late, but we'd like to see more of this happen. So the lesson on both of these is businesses that participate in secular growth trends can mask lots of issues, but not for forever. So for both of these companies, management now needs to be judged on how they deal with the necessary fixes. And in the meantime, as we've disclosed a few times now, we took a position in small cap stock shift for payments ticker symbol F-O-U-R. And we'll see how it goes. 
with PayPal and Block in 2024. But again, the original thesis was secular growth trend, digital payments. Our core holdings are still Visa and MasterCard. But eventually, at some point, if the only thing PayPal and Block have going for them is the secular growth trend that is digital payments, and there's little headway in the fixes department, getting those business model issues fixed, we'll be moving on from these. But we're being patient for now. Next company, Shopify, or ticker symbol SHOP. Shopify continues to solidify its position as a leading software player despite facing headwinds in 2023. While growth slowed compared to its explosive pandemic surge, it remains impressive, especially after selling off the logistics portion of the business. Their strong financial performance, robust ecosystem of partners, and unwavering focus on customer success gives us a lot of confidence going forward. Though not immune to broader economic pressure, Shopify's strong fundamentals and strategic agility suggest it's well positioned to navigate challenges and maintain its dominance in the evolving e-commerce landscape. So this is the first in, in our last few stocks where we're actually happy to continue holding these. It's not a, a reluctant hold with us looking for the exit. And the reason is Shopify did make a number of mistakes during the pandemic. It overspent, assuming that the absolutely explosive growth from the pandemic would just continue for forever. But Shopify is profitable on a free cash flow basis. On a gap basis, you, you have to do a little bit of homework and peel back some non-recurring items. For example, you know Shopify has a, a number of large positions in publicly traded stocks that kind of mask the gap profitability picture. But the business itself, on a free cash flow basis, very much profitable. And the reason... We think that is, is they quickly identified mistakes that they made and were more than willing to get rid of those mistakes, to part ways with them. You mentioned the logistics business getting offloaded. We like Shopify management's ability to identify those mistakes and have the humility to just admit it and move on and refocus on the best parts of the business. Shopify, the lesson, identify your mistakes, fix them and move on quickly. Our next stock we still hold, Pinterest, ticker symbol P-I-N-S, pins. Pinterest has actually very quietly had a, a nice comeback. Now, this is another one that got a new CEO in 2022, and we were happy to see uh, some strategic changes, a bit of a change in direction for Pinterest. And then we just kind of forgot that we had it after we, we saw those changes made, and it, it's paid off. So the new CEO, Bill Reddy, started delivering some more consistent growth as they've repositioned Pinterest as a, a type of uh, e-commerce business, monetizing at this point, primarily with advertising revenue. Profit margins are on the rise. That's why we forgot about the stock being in our portfolio and we're happy that we did. The lesson for this stock is really easy. Big subscriber bases give a company a lot of options when it comes to making money. Next stock that we kept in our portfolio is Wix, W-I-X. Wix is, of course, a website builder that we thought was maybe left for dead and came back in 2023 60% up. Although it remains down from its 2021 peak, strong revenue growth and profitability progress are promising. Wix is integrating new partners and is helping developers use generative AI, which of course in this age of AI is a huge bonus. Yeah, Wix has turned itself into a, a promising little web business again. Of course, not the rapid growth that it was enjoying just a couple of years ago. But the lesson here, Casey, a, a lot of companies had the potential to turn the corner on profitability. Many of them failed to do that, but Wix has pulled it off. So we're interested in continuing to watch management continue to execute on that front as it goes from this highly unprofitable to now potentially very, very profitable business. And if, if they continue to execute on that, we think the stock actually is pretty reasonably valued at this point. So we're happy to continue holding and see what happens in 2024. All right. The last one we're happy to hold in 2024. It was a wild ride for DigitalOcean, ticker symbol 
DOC. And so we are still waiting for an update on the CEO situation. It was announced last year that CEO Yancey Spruill would be leaving. We don't know who the replacement will be. But in the meantime, DigitalOcean has been making some pretty solid progress on profit margins. Revenue growth, again, has become quite pedestrian, but we think that's largely due to macroeconomic factors last year. We think there's some potential for revenue growth to accelerate again in 2024, but of course, we'll continue to be focused on what DigitalOcean has kind of touted itself as being all along, a balance of not just growth, but profitable growth. Company generates healthy free cash flow margins. A lesson for us on this company is small caps are especially volatile and we have to leave them some room to run. It can be very easy to allow the stock price to dictate what we do with our investment. However, our investment thesis for this company is still very much intact. And so we're willing to ride this one out for now. I just want to reiterate that last point that you made, because that's so, so important, especially having gone through this bear market the last two years, is we do see a lot of that. A lot of investors who have an investment thesis and their thesis on the business itself get shaken by the stock price. And if you're a long-term investor, we've got to learn, continuously learn to separate the two. The stock price is not an automatic reflection of the business thesis itself. I really like that last one to conclude on. Let's close out this video. Stocks we sold, stocks we still hold. At the end of this week, we will get back to chip stocks. We'll get back to being chip stock investor and have some deeper dives into the semiconductor world and the greater IT landscape, AI and such. If you wanna keep up with all the stocks in our portfolio, make sure you're subscribed. Also have notifications enabled because we do post frequent updates on our community board. Also, if you're a fan of our content and you find it valuable, there are a couple of ways you can support the channel. You can join the membership on YouTube, which gets you some custom badges and emojis that you can use in the comments. You can also hit that super thanks button on YouTube. Lastly, you can head over to our Ko-fi page and you can find our semiconductor industry flow manual for 2024 which you can purchase there in our shop. All of your support goes towards our time and efforts to research and provide content that is accurate and up-to-date. Thanks so much for your support. We appreciate it here at Chipstock Investor. See you soon.